for many outside commentators, the war in Syria is a confusing and depressing statement to the depth of human fucking savagery. And while it is most certainly that, there is also another side to this conflict, which has been hidden away from popular consumption. This is the story of the brave peeps who collectively rose up against a brutal dictator and who valiantly continued to struggle for freedom and dignity in the face of horrific violence. So, in an effort to shed some well-needed light on this other aspect of the Syrian revolution, I recently caught up with Robin Yassin Kassab, a Syrian-British journalist and co-author of Burning Country, Syrians in Revolution and War. Hey Robin, how the fuck are you? I'm very well indeed. Back in January, you and your co-author Leila Al-Shami published Burning Country, Syrians in Revolution and War, which is widely regarded as one of the best English language accounts of the Syrian revolution. What inspired you to write this book? Um, I think we wrote the book because we felt that the story of the Syrian revolution and then the, the various counter-revolutions which, which, which came back at it um, wasn't being told properly. Everybody knows about the jihadists and the head choppers and everybody knows about Putin and Turkey and Qatar and Saudi Arabia, but nobody seems to know about, you know, grassroots Syrian workers and farmers and, and students who were going out there and protesting and then who began to pick up weapons when they were, were so oppressed. So we, we, we did it because we wanted to give a voice to those remarkable Syrian revolutionaries which we thought that they were lacking in the English language and in the West. You have been pretty fucking outspoken in your criticisms of the international response to the conflict in Syria and particularly scathing with regards to the posture adopted by Western leftists. What in particular pisses you off about how peeps have approached the situation? And what do you think that this says about the current state of the left more generally? Well, I think it's been really depressing, really tragic that a lot of Syrians expected at the start that they would be getting help from the, or solidarity from the leftists, the so-called anti-imperialists in the West, and very often it was the left, at least the mainstream or dominant left, which misrepresented them and spread lies about them even before the right did. So for example, you know, nowadays we have the right wing telling us that all these Syrian refugees, they're all Al-Qaeda, they're all dangerous jihadists, so we shouldn't let any of them in. This notion that every Syrian or every Syrian revolutionary is Al-Qaeda was actually spread by lots of people on the left. I think what the left has done, um, not just in the case of Syria, but in general, tragically, the left has given up on ordinary people. It, it seems to have lost hope that, that people at the grassroots can actually change things. And therefore, it's just um, got itself obsessed with states. It seems to think that being left-wing is about supporting certain states against other states, as if there are, you know, goody states against the baddie state. But that's not classical leftism, it's not Marxism. I mean, Marxism talked about doing a class analysis in which you um, give your support to the working classes in their struggle against the, the ruling classes. And I think that's what leftists should be doing if they want to be in any way relevant to, to real struggles in the world. They should be supporting people within every state who are trying to fight against their oppressors. And the left has failed to do that and instead through this um, very inaccurate state-based analysis they're just making silly assumptions. They seem to think, for example, that this is a regime change plot directed by the United States against a glorious resistance regime in Syria. Um, and, you know, the facts don't bear that out at all. You've stated on several occasions your belief that the Syrian revolution has been the most significant revolution since 1930 Spain. Could you elaborate on this? In the revolution, and then a particularly as it became a war, when the regime was forced to withdraw from certain parts of the, the country, as the regime withdrew, it withdrew the services that it offered, of course. The state collapsed. And what you had then was that in many different parts of the, the country, people started setting up their own self-organized administrations. So they set up local councils, for example. At the moment, there are about 400 local councils um, operating in the liberated areas of Syria. And these are the people who are keeping life together in the liberated areas under the bombs in the most difficult circumstances. They're keeping the electricity going, they're keeping the water supply going, they're um, trying to build makeshift hospitals and underground schools where, where people can be educated despite the, the bombs. 
Um, this is remarkable, this, this self-organisation, this, this local democracy, and nobody notices it, no, but nobody talks about it. It's much easier for us to talk about the Saudis and the Russians and the states than it is to talk about the remarkable things that people are doing. Not just councils, women's centres, free radio stations, free television stations, newspapers, an explosion of popular art. All of this kind of thing is happening in Syria, in the middle of an awful war, in, in, amid starvation sieges. It's really remarkable and it's inspiring what's happening in Syria as well as tragic and it's our loss that we don't pay more attention to it. Outside of Rojava, many Western anarchists are unfamiliar with the influential role that anarchists have played in the Syrian revolution, a prime example being Omar Aziz. Can you tell us a little bit more about who he was and his material and theoretical contributions to the revolutionary process? Yeah, well, Omar Aziz was a remarkable man and a very influential man. He was an anarchist. I mean, he, he self-identified as um, an anarchist. Of course, many of the people who set up the, the self-organized committees and councils that we were talking about do not necessarily use the word anarchist to, to describe themselves. They don't necessarily come from that theoretical tradition. They haven't necessarily read Bakunin and, and so on. Um, but what they're doing is, is anarchist. Omar Aziz actually identified as an anarchist and he'd obviously read a lot of anarchism and studied it. He was living outside of Syria. He came back to join the revolution and then in the eighth month he wrote a paper in which he said it's not enough to go out and protest. We have to withdraw from the state and, and stop giving our consent and we have to set up our own alternative bodies and organizations. And he recommended setting up local councils, the local councils I was just talking about. He helped to set up three of the first local councils in the Damascus suburbs, and then he was arrested. Then he died in prison. Some people say he was tortured to death. We don't know. He already had um, weak health when he, he went into prison. He died there a day before his 64th birthday. But after he died, this model that he had helped to build spread like wildfire, particularly in 2012, 2013, as the regime was withdrawing from, from key areas of the country, people were setting up local councils everywhere. It's also important to remember, I mean, in a way that, you know, anarchists in the, in the West can identify with Omar Aziz to an extent, if they've heard of him, because he identified as an anarchist. But then, you know, when we're looking at cultures which we as Westerners don't immediately recognize, Islamic cultures, African cultures, you know, all, cultures all over the world, people there may be using their own vocabulary, their own, their own cultural vocabulary, but they're sometimes arriving at the same conclusions of self-organization and cooperation that anarchists in the West would hope that they arrive to. So that, that's interesting, and I think we need to look out for that in the future. What effects have the revolution and the subsequent civil war had in terms of women's participation in Syrian society? As a result of the the revolution, um, women have been empowered a great deal. And then as a result of the counter-revolutionary war, um, in many ways, things have gone backwards. In terms of the revolution, I mean, Razan Zaytouni, a woman, um, was the, the founder of the local coordination committees, a grassroots revolutionary unit which was set up at the start and spread all over the country. There was another group of coordination committees set up by Sohera Tasi, another woman. So. Those two very important key bodies were set up by women. Um, also what you've had during the, the revolution in liberated areas is, is a lot of women's centers have been set up by women themselves um, in order to encourage women's participation in the revolution, in society, in the economy, in order to teach skills where necessary and also as places where they can go and, and talk and express solidarity to each other and, and, and try and find common solutions to their problems. I think that the, the fact of revolutionary work as well has to an extent liberated women. Everything um, has been questioned in Syria in the last years, including the relations between men and women, between husbands and wives, between fathers and, and daughters, parents and children. On the other hand, you know, of course, the fact of war um, in many ways has made things terrible for women. I mean, women have been um, subject to a, a mass rape campaign, which the, the regime organized. ISIS also, of course, has raped women and has made, made Yazidi women into sex slaves. All of this kind of barbarism has gone on. The fact of war has, has victimized women in particular. But um, 
the revolutionary impulses are there and I think they will continue. And I think that women who've had a taste of, of activism and, and freedom, if only for a moment during the revolution, are not going to, to give that up and they're going to pass that on to their daughters. Anything else you want to add? I think that we should really be paying much more attention because, as I said, it's remarkable what Syrians are doing socially, politically and culturally as well as all of the terrible things, the torture, the jihadism, the, the bombing, the rest of it, there's, there's all of this cultural explosion, the free newspapers, the, the community cooperation that's happening, which we could learn from. This kind of thing doesn't happen very often in history. And certainly people who claim to be revolutionaries, anarchists and leftists, they really should be the first people who are without prejudice, without silly binaries, without worshipping different lines set out by states, they should be attending to what's happening on the ground at the grassroots and showing some solidarity.